All right, it is 2.15 and let's get started. Hello everyone and welcome to the Symposium on Advancing Equity in Higher Education on Long Island. I am your host of this panel, Campus Partnerships, How They Can Lead to Access and Inclusion. My name is Nikki Loader with Stony Brook University Libraries and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Before our presentation begins, there are just a few quick announcements and housekeeping matters that I would like to mention. First, you would notice two options on your screen, a chat and a Q&A tool. As your moderator, I will mon monitor both throughout the session, but we'll save questions for the end. Questions are welcome via the Q&A tool throughout the presentation. You can also chat to panelists to get help with any technical issues and also chat for conversation among attendees. Second, we are dedicated to providing a symposium experience that is free from all forms of harassment and is inclusive of all people. Please be respectful of presenter and attendee experiences when participating in this session. This session is being recorded and will be available after the presentation on the SBU Library's YouTube channel. Please be aware that chat transcripts, even private chats, will be captured by Zoom during recorded sessions. I will now turn to our presenters. Thank you for joining Wendy Matthews, she, her, hers, Glenn Dausch, he, him, his, and Patricia Dunn, she, her, hers, from all from Stuenberg University. Take it away, guys. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you. My name is Wendy Matthews. I'm the director over at Student Accessibility Support Center. Um, we like to say we're sassy here. Um, I've been at Stony Brook University for about nine years, and I've been director for about, um, I think I'm going on my third year, or they all blend together, especially now. Um, but I know my colleagues and myself are really excited to be here today and to really talk about the overarching theme of accessibility. You can find on the first slide here, we do have a link for anyone um, who would like to see these slides afterwards um, for you to be able to do that. So what is on the agenda today? Um, so we're gonna talk the connection between accessibility and disability services, COVID impact, universal design, the faculty's role, digital accessibility and providing access in the classroom. So before we start talking about accessibility, let's talk a little bit about disability. So what is a disability? Um, it's an individual um, with a physical or mental impairment that substantially, substantially limits one or major life activities, um, has a record of such an impairment or regarding as having such an impairment. So why students with disabilities don't access services? And I think this is an overall point, you know, when we're working with students and with faculty, a lot of times people will say to us, you know, why don't students register, you know, with your department? Um, and this can fall under stigma and shame, fear of discrimination, do not wanting to identify themselves as a person with a disability, believe that services or accommodations are no longer needed. This happens a lot for students that we're working with that maybe had accommodations in high school, or in their um, community college experience. And then now they come you know, to the higher level and they are believing that they don't need accommodations. They no longer want services or accommodations or disability services are inaccessible. So I love this slide right here. Um, and this is when we're talking about access. So if you can see in this picture, um, what we have is a person who is shoveling, um, there's snow on the ground, there are individuals who I think we're probably at a school. There are stairs that the person is clearing of snow and then there's a ramp. And you can see in the picture, it says clearing a path for people with special needs clears a path for everyone. And in the, in the captions, it says, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs when I get through shoveling them off, then I will make a clear ramp for you. And then you have the person who has a wheelchair or a motorized device but if you shovel the ramp, we can all get in. Could you please just shovel the ramp? And again, this is showing you really truly the meaning of access. So what does accessible mean? A person with a disability is afforded the opportunity to acquire the same information or engage in the same interactions and enjoy the same services as equally effective and equally integrated manner. The person with the disability must be able to obtain the information fully equally and independently of a person with or without a disability. So basically what we're saying is access for all. 
So the connection between functional limitations and barriers. So when I talk about functional limitations, this is something that we use um, within the disability services departments. And what we're talking about here is to really understand how the, the person's disability impacts their experiences, whether that's academic, housing, classroom experiences. So you can see I just made some examples here of what that could be. So underneath academics, Students with a medical disability might impact their attendance within the classroom. A neurodiverse student might need a private location for testing. A student that is hearing impaired or deaf might need captioning or sign language interpreters. Or a student with a learning disability may need extra times, which is the most common accommodation you'll find at most disability offices. Underneath housing, student with mobility disability needing an accessible room or student needing a medical single or a medical or psychological needs. And then we also have classroom experiences as well, where we might be needing to move a student to a different location because the classroom is not accessible, or a student might need a specific seat within the classroom. But we really try to get an understanding of you know, what the functional limitations or barriers are. So one of the common questions um, or statements I receive from faculty I always like to call it like my disability pitfall. Um, faculty will say, but I've never had a student with a disability in my class before. And I put a picture on here and it says not every disability is visible. And I think that when we talk about disability, a lot of times we have this image in our head of more of a physical disability, something you can see, but there are many disabilities that are not visible. And we need to make sure that when we're thinking of disability, that that is something that we're taking into account. So on campuses, you have a disability office. It's a federally mandated office. Um, what these offices really do is they offer accommodations and services for students that identify as having a disability underneath the ADA. Um, and this really provides them you know, equal access. And the disability offices go through what we call a reasonable accommodation process to really understand you know, based on the right documentation and what we call an interactive process, which is meeting with the student, to know how the disability is impacting them academically, housing, sometimes it's a temporary condition, but mostly what our offices do is collaboration, communication, and creativity, um, especially in the times that we're living in right now, I find us to be the most creative folks um, on campuses. So when we talk about accessibility, I, I can't not mention COVID. Um, so you can, if in the picture right here, I have um, a meteor basically hitting earth. And, you know, when we talk about accommodations and accessibility for students, it's important to know that students that transition into higher education have a difficult time transitioning to the begin with. And then you have an individual with a disability, and sometimes that can be even more challenging. Now let's add in COVID to that. Um, so many of our students that, you know, have used accommodations before, whether it was, you know, before they were new to us or they were currently here, COVID really impact them and how they were receiving their educational experience. So I use this kind of meteor as, you know, just an example of kind of the explosion because we didn't know what to expect. Um, and it really was something that once it kind of hit, we needed to act fast to make sure that students were being provided with their accommodations that they needed. So AHEAD put out some research, um, you know, talking about the transition to remote learning um, with COVID. And I think this is important when we're talking about accessibility and to really understand the student's experience in the classroom to know what some of the barriers are. So some of the barriers that have been identified um, is receiving testing accommodations. Um, people had said 61% students responded that that was a, a major issue. Um, discussing new access and barriers and solutions. And this is where I talk about disability offices really being those creative people because we're having to come up with solutions that we um, never have had before to make sure things are accessible. Um, participating in the interactive process, receiving their CART um, or their TypeWell kind of services or even their interpreting services if they had sign language interpreters. And another thing just to highlight is for disability offices, providing documentation for a disability office. Um, when we went remote, a lot of places went remote as well. A lot of providers went remote. Um, a lot of providers weren't open. So it was very difficult for students with disabilities to be able to access documentation to get connected with um, their disability offices. 
Areas of difficulty for dis disability resource partners, that would be our faculty, campus community, um, needing technology support. Um, some faculty, you know, have never um, really used the tech piece before, and now they were finding themselves in a, a place to be able to do that. Um, communicating, you know, what is an inclusive course design, and I know that Glenn and um, Patty will be talking a lot about this later. Um, communicating with students not registered um, with the disability office and institutional support for accessibility um, considerations. These were all things that were identified as difficulty with the transition to remote um, experience, remote learning with disability services. Did you experience difficulty in the transition to remote disability services? And again, this is just things that, you know, continuation, access to Wi-Fi, um, need of the tech support training, um, receiving administrative requests re related to individuals' needs. So when we talk about a lot of these things, um, it's important to talk about universal design because if you have universal design put in place, a lot of the things that were identified are things that you know, might not be a barrier or an issue. So when we talk about universal design, it's a way of thinking um, that provides the teachings and learnings that gives all students equal opportunity to be able to exceed. The approach offers flexibility, which I think that's the world we're living in right now, to know what to know what students can access materials, engage with, and to show what they know. So this is really providing different ways for students to be able to show what they're learning, but also for faculty and staff to deliver things to a variety of individuals with different needs. Questions to ask yourself, are students aware of overreaching goals in your course? Does the curriculum provide an opportunity for students to display mastery in a variety of ways? Is there a consideration for learning styles when presenting information? These are all questions that should be asked when you are um, thinking about your course. Universal design in action, um, just to give you an example, like summarize key points, um, encourage students to demonstrate their knowledge in a variety of different ways, whether it's traditional tests or written essays, projects, portfolios. Um, using different types of technologies to facilitate a class communication and making yourself available you know, during office hours. But one of the biggest things that we try to advertise um, and talk about its importance is it all starts at the syllabus. Being able to have a syllabus statement, and I know Patty's gonna talk a lot about this, is so important. And it allows your students to know that if they need services, where to go, and to also know that, they're, that you're not putting a stigma attached to it and that you're comfortable with acknowledging if there is a disability that there are services for people um, you know, to utilize. The role of the faculty is key. Um, you know, you hold students with disabilities to the same standards as non-disabled students, um, adhere to the institution's, you know, processes and procedures, and mostly respect the disability specialist. Um, these are individuals who, you know, work in this area. They really understand, you know, what the needs of the students are, and their, their work is to communicate with you on that. I'm not going to touch too much upon this. It is in the slides, but faculty questions answered. I mean, accommodations aren't retroactive. It's important to know that. Um, we establish reasonable deadlines for students um, with their accommodation letters. Um, and to also know that, you know, we partner with other university partners throughout a campus community to make sure that students always are having access um, to their accommodations. This is just a plug. When you get a chance, take a look at it. It's our sassy sensory room. Um, I'll have that a little bit later, but we all need time to relax right now. I'm sure, especially after this long day, this is a sensory room we created where it gives people a chance to um, stimulate along with relaxation. Take a look at it. It's a great place to be. We recommend it to our students and I'm also recommending it to everyone on this uh, presentation today. I'm gonna turn this over um, now uh, to Glenn, who's gonna talk a little bit about accessibility and his services as well. And Glenn, you can take it away. Thanks, Wendy. And uh, welcome everyone. As uh, Nikki said before, I'm Glenn Dausch. I am the Web Accessibility Officer within the Office of Equity and Access here at Stony Brook University. And our mission is to uphold the university, <clears throat> uh, the university's mission in reaffirming a safe and equitable uh, learning, recreational and educational environment for all. So my role is really to serve as a subject matter expert with respect to accessibility, uh, testing, and uh, processes. I lead our efforts uh, to develop 
uh, sorry, I lead our efforts um, with respect to our digital accessibility program and making sure that the content products and services we use are accessible to all. And uh, so what we're doing here today is modeling a number of best practices. Um, as you'll notice before, Wendy read out a number of the uh, images that were on the slides. Um, and we do that so that uh, if you're using a, a phone connection or have limited bandwidth, um, or for whatever reason can't see the slide, you have access to that visual information. Um, we announced our names as we're starting so that there's no um, confusion as to who the speaker is. And we also shared accessible versions of the slides uh, at the start of our presentation. Uh, Wendy, if you could go to the next slide, please. So this is a slide you may have seen before. Wendy started off with this definition of accessibility and, and uh, we're just going to repeat it and, and look at a few key elements of this definition. Um, individuals with disabilities are able to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services. Here are the two key prongs of the definition of accessibility that I want us to think about throughout uh, the, the rest of our uh, discussion today. Within the same time frame as uh, an individual without a disability and with substantially equivalent ease of use. So at the same time frame, let's think about that for a second. If we uh, were to put up uh, an assignment and uh, the student has to, to complete an assignment online and the tool that we're using is not accessible, it's not okay for us to then say to that student, well, um, you can, you know, we'll, we'll provide somebody that can read the assignment with you or, or input the information so that you can complete the assignment. Because uh, as you could tell with uh, the, the way we use the internet today, any student could log on at three in the morning and complete that assignment. Um, we're not going to ask somebody to be available at that person's beck and call to complete the assignment. Um, the next prong here is substantially equivalent ease of use. This goes back to our, our planning, thinking about the, the tools and services we use. Are they accessible to everyone? Are we asking students, faculty, staff, or community members with a disability to take extra steps to have access to the information? Um, and it's really important to think about that entire process. Uh, it's not something that uh, we're used to doing. So it just it takes us to be a little bit more deliberate in our process uh, to really understand what we're asking of somebody to be able to access our services. And the, this is really important. Uh, and I know Wendy spoke about this earlier. When we think about the impact of COVID. Uh, we had to turn around within a week and bring everything online. Um, and if our material is not accessible, it's going to be exceedingly difficult to provide that information at the same time in an accessible format. Um, Wendy, next slide, please. So in uh, early uh, 2019, and it was published in 2020, Educause uh, ran a study uh, where they interviewed several students, uh, sorry, a group of students on uh, their use of technology in a college setting. Um, and I have a, a graphic here um, that shows uh, that 46% uh, of students who were asked, uh, they uh, registered with their college's office for students with disabilities. 44% of those students did not. Um, and so that's really, really underscores the point that Wendy was making before. There are a number of reasons why students don't do that. Um, but here's the key number that I, I want to focus on. 32% of the students uh, in that study indicated that their disability uh, required them to have material in some for form of an accessible format. Um, so if we don't produce accessible material, we know for a fact that we are leaving out a su substantial portion uh, of our student body. Without those accessible materials, it's not going to be possible for those students uh, to complete the course successfully um, or for those uh, faculty to be able to engage in, in their job in an accessible manner. And we really want to make sure that uh, everybody is able to finish in four. Uh, Wendy, next slide, please. So here we have a, a graphic um, 
that shows the difference between access, um, equity, and overall accessibility. Um, there's a, a graphic that shows three separate panels of uh, individuals watching a, a, a sporting event. Uh, in the first panel, um, we have a, a number of uh, people who are all standing on the same platform uh, trying to see over a fence. In the second panel, uh, that plat those platforms have been um, raised or lowered to allow um, people of differing heights to be able to see over the fence. And so some people are uh, standing on the ground and some are on platforms. And in the third panel, uh, the, chain, the, the fence was replaced with a chain link fence allowing everyone to see through the fence. Um, and this then allowed everybody to be able to, to observe uh, what was going on beyond the fence. So this really uh, looking at the third outcome here, um, if we plan for accessibility deliberately, um, we're going to be providing that access uh, that some people absolutely require in order to participate, um, but that equitable experience is going to benefit everyone. Um, we don't have to question whether somebody can step up to the platform um, because everybody is standing on the same level ground. Um, and so, uh, Wendy, if you could go to the next slide, please. However, sometimes in our planning, we tend to look for shortcuts. And so one of the ways that we do this now um, is through technology. Uh, what I have here is a automated description of the, the previous slide. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, is descriptions for images. Uh, and so I took this, this image and ran it through a tool that provides an automated description. Um, fortunately for me, I um, had somebody else describe this image to me because the automated description says, this caption is a description of a cartoon photo. There's text in the photo, equality, equity, liberation, and this object probably appears in the photo, a person. Uh, that description certainly doesn't capture uh, what we just spoke about. Um, so it's important when we're looking for technological solutions that we trust but verify. Wendy, next slide, please. I'm going to go through the next uh, number of slides rather quickly because we are running short on time. Uh, but how do we make content accessible? Uh, there is a um, number of guidelines put out by uh, the web, World Wide Web Consortium. Um, and these are called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, there are four categories here um, perceivable, and that means can somebody understand the content that you're, you're providing to them. Uh, so for example, uh, if you're showing a video and there is um, audio but no captions, uh, somebody who can't hear the video certainly could not perceive the content of that presentation. Uh, likewise, if you're showing an image and there's no text description, somebody who can't see the image would not be able to um, engage with that content. Um, operable. And that means, can we interact with the content? Um, we do, when we're interacting with web content nowadays, we're using more than just the mouse. Uh, try this on. If you're uh, at your computer, put the mouse aside or turn off your trackpad and try to interact with the keyboard. Um, use just your uh, tab, arrow, and enter keys and, and try to accomplish all of your tasks. Um, if you are in a Google application, um, you can look for a number of shortcuts. Or if you're in uh, Microsoft Office, there are also a number of keyboard shortcuts that will speed up those processes for you. And, and I know Patty's going to uh, show what that process looks like in a few minutes. Uh, Wendy, next slide, please. So some simple tips to check for accessibility. Here, it's important to remember that uh, disabilities can be acquired. Uh, disabilities can be temporary. Um, so, um, you know, 
as Wendy said, you may not know if you have a student or, or a colleague with a disability, um, but uh, they may be involved in your class or uh, you may be working with a, an individual with a disability and may not know it. Um, Chrome has an emulate vision uh, disability tool. Um, and that's an important tool that you can use to check and see how your information would look if you uh, were colorblind or had to view information in grayscale. And then our last tip here is to uh, zoom your content to 200%. Make sure that nothing's being covered up or, uh, or missed. And next slide. Um, so we have a number of tips here. Provide alt text for images. We spoke about uh, what alt text was earlier and why that's important. Um, and audio description, likewise, um, is equally important. I'm going to share a, a video out shortly uh, to show you what this audio description would look like. And lastly, provide captions. Next slide, please. Um, so again, some other tips here. Um, Read through your content without looking at the images. Does the text cover everything you uh, intended to? Watch your presentation, if it's a, a video or a, a PowerPoint, um, with the sound off. Are you missing anything? Um, or listen to your video with the sound off. Again, are you missing anything? Next slide. Um, OK. So uh, when you're creating your content, um, I'm actually going to skip this slide because Patty's going to cover a lot of this uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so some tools that are available to you uh, on campus, Blackboard Ally, uh, Microsoft's Accessibility Checker. Turn this on ahead of time. Uh, you can go to the Review tab and enable the Accessibility Checker. And as you're creating your documents, it will let you know if there uh, are ex any accessibility barriers. But remember these, as we said before, these tools aren't foolproof. Uh, Wendy, next slide. And continuing our partnering theme here, uh, some other partners uh, that uh, work closely with us. Uh, we have uh, DQ University, which is a training platform that we're subscribed to. Um, you can look for more uh, information on accessibility practices here. Um, CELT, the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, has a number of resources on their website, and this is linked within the presentation. Our Do It Accessibility Tools, and our um, social media guidelines, which have accessibility practices woven throughout. Wendy, next slide, please. Uh, lastly, um, there are a number of resources here uh, that will help you create alt text, determine when your alt text is needed, and how to describe or caption your videos. And with that, I'm going to leave time for questions later. So on to you, Patty. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, OK, uh, I'm Patricia Dunn. I'm from the English department here at uh, Stony Brook. And I'm gonna talk about common sense, low tech steps towards disability access. Next please, Wendy. So this is a person who uses a wheelchair and sitting in front of stairs that don't have a ramp or an elevator. And there's a saying, it's not my wheelchair that makes me disabled, but the stairs into the building. So um, by putting up a, a ramp or something, the person could, could get in. Next slide, please. Um, when curb cuts were put in, uh, they were put in mostly for people who use wheelchairs, but then there was this thing called curb cut effect because just about everybody uses curb cuts. Here we have a bunch of people going over the curb on bicycles, but also strollers, skateboards, rolling suitcases, all kinds of things. Lots of people use that, that um, accessible tool. Next slide, please. Um, more universal design. Here is an image of a door handle instead of a doorknob uh, for people who don't have the strength to grasp and turn a doorknob for people. Who, but it's also good for people holding groceries, for people whose hands are full, for people whose hands are wet, and also for pets, uh, which doesn't always, it isn't always a good thing. So how about curb cut effect for education? Next, please. Um, as Wendy was saying, and, and Glenn, people possibly not registered at the Student Accessibility Support Center. They might be hard of hearing, they might have low vision, they might have a print disability, they might have trouble focusing for long periods of time, um, they might have bad backs. 
Um, so there are all kinds of reasons people might not um, might not register, but might have um, uh, disability issues. Next, please. Um, some things you can do: think ahead, post syllabus early, so people know what they're getting into. They can read it ahead of time. Make it screen readable. We'll talk about what that is later. Make your class materials, order them screen uh, accessible if you can, uh, screen readable texts, um, books that are available on audio, uh, videos that come with closed captioning. Go with redundancy, put directions in different places and make it easy to find. Um, put your institution's accessibility statement on the syllabus. Consider writing your own statement and putting it on the first page, which is something I do. Uh, here's mine, I put it right on the first page. Um, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help you better access the materials in this class. And then I go on a little bit. That's it on the first page that lets students know that I'm open to them talking to me about their disability. Next, please. Um, consider access check-ins, making sure that people can, can um, see and hear and do what they need to do. For example, instead of saying, uh, can everyone hear me? If you say that, you'll get a couple people who can hear you, they'll be nodding their heads but instead say, raise your hand if you can hear me in the back row. And that way you'll, have, you'll know for sure who can hear you and who can't and you can make adjustments. Um, put um, um, in a face-to-face -face class or meeting, use the microphone if, if it's available, use the mic. The microphone doesn't just um, work with volume, it, it can screen out background noise, which is very helpful. Speak up yourself and ask your students or people in the room to speak up. And if they won't, some people won't, repeat their question or their comment so everyone can hear and describe projected images. Next, please. Um, in a face-to-face -face class, um, get students moving occasionally um, to help them concentrate. Um, group work, gallery walks, brief paired discussions, um, announce upcoming breaks so people can kind of prepare mentally for when they'll be able to go out. Remember that students using wheelchairs or scooters may take longer to get to class, especially in the winter, and try to keep the doorways and aisles clear in your um, class. Next, please. Now, this, uh, in the before times, this was a big debate. It's almost moot now. Uh, should students use devices in a face-to-face -face class? Yes or no? Um, so there's a thumbs up and a thumbs down. Next slide, please. Uh, there are pros and cons. Um, are the, these, these devices in class, classroom distracting? Yes. Can they interfere with teaching? Sometimes. Are they necessary for some students? Absolutely. To take notes, to record a lecture, to enlarge print on documents, and for everybody to access digital course materials without having to print everything up. Uh, be careful that you don't have rules that force some students to disclose a disability. Next, please. More common sense actions. Um, if you're showing videos, they should be closed captioned. Um, and you can buy them that way and turn it on. Or if you're making them yourself, you can use YouTube, Zoom, Amera, or Screencast-O-Matic to put the, um, uh, closed captioning on your videos. If you're showing videos or slides in a classroom, pull the blinds so people can see it better. If you're losing, using links, write descriptive links, like contact us, not click here. Just click here, then people don't know where that's going. If you're using audio files, post the transcript. And uh, Glenn told me an easy way to, to make a transcript. Uh, you go to Google Docs, and I have, uh, this is an image of Google Doc um, screenshot. I have tools circled, and then if you go down to the drop down menu, voice typing, you click on that, you speak, and your words come up on the Google Doc. And they're pretty, they're pretty accurate, and you have to refresh it every now and then, but it works pretty well. In a Zoom meeting or class, describe any images. Um, read comments in the chat aloud or have somebody else monitor it and do that. Share your class notes or slides, preferably ahead of time, and re record the Zoom class. Um, and to get the audio transcript, you have to record it on the cloud, not on your computer. Next. In, um, to show the class agenda. I do that so people know what's coming up, they know what to expect. Make sure everybody knows how to use those reactions and so on on the Zoom screen. Uh, and ask people to say their names after they unmute. That's important. I mean, even um, for those of us who can actually see the whole screen, um, I can't see all my students if I'm projecting something. I can't see everybody's face. So it helps everybody to say their names after they unmute. Nobody does it, by the way, but they should. Next. Um, if you're giving a slide presentation, uh, turn on live captioning. Um, next slide, please. On uh, Google Slides, that's a red arrow pointing down to the closed captioning on Google Slides. Now, um, the 
Live captioning doesn't capture the whole transcript, but it will put the words up there as you are speaking, um, which, is, which is very good, not only for people with certain kinds of disabilities, but people learning a new English as a new language, it helps to have the, the English up there, the words. If you're making a screencast, um, Zoom and Screencast-O-Matic can provide audio transcripts. And as I said, Zoom has to be on the car. Uh, if you want more students to participate in class, consider longer wait time, or maybe rephrase the, rephrase the question. I send questions to students ahead of time. I call them heads up questions. So they have them ahead of time, a couple of days. And then uh, if I cold call um, them in class, I only cold call them on the questions I put ahead of time, which they know are coming. So it's not quite as shocking. Um, you can let them think or write for one to two minutes before an oral discussion. So people have time to gather their thoughts and have something to say. In a classroom, you can have students write questions on index cards, um, or in a Zoom, you can use a Google Doc, a Google Form, or even the chat itself. And you can do think, pair, share in a classroom or breakout groups in, in Zoom. If you're responding to student work, instead of having them trying to read your, your chicken scratch writing, consider typing marginal or end comments in Word or Google Docs. You can also do um, oral comments in Google Docs. Um, I can do oral commentary via just voice message on your phone um, or a screencast is very good. We, we can speak so many more words more quickly than we can write. Here's some low tech steps towards accessibility. I'm gonna talk about all text and image descriptions and structured headings. Um, so this is an image and this is the all text or alternative text or image description that I would uh, describe it as. Two sketches juxtaposed. On the left, the world, a globe, is being held up by five stick figures who look happy. On the right, one unhappy looking stick figure is bent over at 180 degree angle, carrying the whole world on their back. Okay. So how to add it? Well, there are different ways. On a PC, if you're working in Word, you would right click on the image, then a drop down menu would come up and you'd click on edit alt text. Then you would add your description and then simply close the drop down menu. Next. So it looks like this. This is a screenshot of what it looks like. There's the drop down menu, and I have edit all text there on the right um, highlighted. Next. And then a little box pops up on the right, um, and you, you can't read the small print there, but that's where the alt text goes, what I just read to you, two sketches juxtaposed. So you, you enter it there, and then there's a little X. You simply close it, and it disappears into the code, but the screen reader will read it. If you don't add that, the person's screen reader will simply say image. But if you do add it, then you get the description that I just gave. Um, to add all text to an image on a MacBook in Word, you would double click on the image, you would choose layout and properties, and then you would choose all text. Yeah. So um, you double click, uh, layout and properties is that little um, blue square in the right corner of the, the screen there. You can hardly see it. Uh, but that's what that is. That's layout and properties. You click on that, and then all text is underneath. And there's the same image. On a Mac, if you're adding all text to a Google Doc, you would select the image, then control click, then all text. You add your all text, and you click OK. And there's the drop down menu on the right. Next, please. Um, and, and here's what that box looks like. You can give it a title, like Black Dog on Green Grass. Uh, the description is a black lab border collie mix lies in the grass looking at the camera, a speech tag over him says, what? And that's my dog, AJ, who's modeling here. And then you click OK, and it's done. Next, please. Um, adding alt text to an image on Google Slides in a Mac. Uh, you, set, you select the image, and there's my door handle there. You hit Control, click, and then alt text. Um, and if the, here, the description is just a photo of the door handle. Next, please. Uh, I teach my students to use alt text. Why? Because they should be. On uh, Google Docs, in Word files, I require it, as a matter of fact. You can also use alt text on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And there's a link there on the right to the Rooted in Rights video, which is a great little video on how to, to add it to social media. And a fun fact, um, using Twitter, you capitalize the first letter of the hashtag, uh, which helps with screen reading. Uh, also, let Word help you and let Blackboard help you. And Glenn was talking about this a bit. So um, if you're putting in a, a heading, a title and a heading, don't just bold it or make the type bigger um, or, or the font. Go to headings styles option via the home tab in Word to help the screen reader scan your document more easily. So there's the things. 
the accessibility checker in Word. You go to file, information, check for issues, check accessibility, um, and you can see it's highlighted there, and then um, it will tell you what you're doing wrong and how to fix it. Next, please. You can use the accessibility checker in Word, Excel, PowerPoints. You do select review and check accessibility, and you can see it's highlighted there. Uh, Blackboard, uh, this is for teachers, uh, instructors. Um, the students don't see those little orange gauges, but they tell me that my PDFs are not accessible. So I click on them. Next slide, please. And it tells me that my uh, they're only 46% um, accessible. So it tells me uh, how to fix that. Next, please. So to review, think ahead, use large print, speak up, use the mic, repeat students' questions, have scripts for audio files, turn on closed captions, um, use screen readable documents and materials, um, all text for image descriptions. Um, okay, so my time is up, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, presenters. That was amazing. I just want to remind everyone, feel free to put any questions in the Q&A box. I'll also be going through the chat box. So if you have any questions in there, I will also be reading those off. I also just want to note that if for any of those who are not looking at the chat, there was a message, I believe, targeted towards Glenn's presentation for the automated accessibility checker. And they had said Moodle ha also has accessibility checker for files you upload students don't see it. Um, and there is also a question in the chat uh, about what about dealing with text and images in Ubuntu for the Linux operating system. Um, and that could be if anyone wants to take that question, take it away. I'll take that question, Nikki. Um, so if you're working in Ubuntu, um, I would assume that you're you're working um, either in uh, Google Docs um, or uh, another open office editor. Um, I would I would stick with Google Docs and you could follow the same procedures that uh, Patty had outlined earlier um, to add image uh, descriptions and mark up the headings in uh, in documents using Docs. Great. Um, and while everyone is maybe thinking of some questions, um, I actually have a question. Uh, Wendy had mentioned some of the challenges for accessibility during COVID. Did any of you see any maybe wins or successes, even if it was tied with a challenge? I'd be really curious to know about that. So I can speak, you know, on my end. Um, I think that the first thing it taught us that we're all resilient. Um, we were actually talking to presenters right before this. Um, it showed us the resiliency of our students, the way our students had to adapt in such a short time frame um, to going online. And I think I one of the biggest things I saw was faculty becoming so resourceful. I had faculty that they were like, you know what, Wendy, we don't know if we have a student in our class who needs accommodations, but we know that we're online. So we want to make our whole course accessible. How do we do that? So I think for me, it was, it put it more out there for, for individuals that we need accessibility. And I found that a lot of faculty rose to the occasion about, you know, just making their courses accessible so that, you know, it was more of a universal design approach. And just to, to, Piggyback on what Wendy said, you know, I, I think one of the things that um, this transition to a largely digital event, um, you know, really showed is that um, some of the areas where we think of universal design's importance, um, you know, for example, captions on on videos uh, or um, descriptions on images. Um, you know, not everybody has the same access to bandwidth. So if you have a transcript or you're using all text properly, um, somebody who is able to download the text, but not the images or the video is able to participate. And we can't, you know, as, as highlighted several times throughout the day today, um, we cannot operate under the assumption that everybody has the same access to technology um, as we're operating with. So I see a question that uh, came up um, in the chat um, and it was, you know, more surrounding, you know, students that maybe have identified with having anxiety and maybe are unable to complete the semester. 
Um, one of the things I would say is for you know any student with a disability that identifies that there is a disability that's impacting impacting them um, is to definitely consult with your disability office that you have on campus because you don't wanna be making accommodations for students without the guidance of the disability office. And the reason I say it puts, it puts you at a, a you know, liability stance. And we wanna make sure that we're protecting not only the student's confidentiality, but we're also you know, protecting the faculty and you know, whatever university. So in a situation where a student maybe has come to you um, and is talking to you regarding their disability, I think there's a way to make them feel supported, but then also to let them know that it's important for you to be able to discuss this with the disability office so that you know that you can receive guidance. I always say that every case is different. It's not so black and white, and there is that you know shade of gray. Um, and I think it's important to be able to consult with whatever counselor regarding that specific student so that you can you know identify if an, maybe an incomplete might be necessary in that situation. Great, we also have one more question on the Q&A for Wendy. Were the new students uh, that reached out during COVID because of the impact of distance challenges and did they realize they, and did they, realize they needed to get tested to have access to accommodations? Um, yeah, I think I... Yeah, so we actually, um, our numbers, you know, the trajectory always is we always get an increase in our students and we did receive a lot of students that maybe weren't registered with us before, but that I did that now did identify um, because of a variety of things I will tell you one of the things that we're seeing right now in our office. Um, is that we're seeing a lot of students that have had COVID and now are having those long lasting impacts of COVID. Um, so now we're having to create, you know, accommodations around that. And also, you know, I don't think that any of us know the long lasting effects of the mental health piece that has gone into this. Um, and, you know, I've spoken to a lot of other mental health professionals, my other colleagues, and we do expect that we're going to see a lot of students that are identifying, you know, as having a disability, a disability because of these factors. Great. Uh, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A in the chat. So I think, and I think our time is just about up. So I wanna thank again, all the uh, present presenters for the great work that you shared with us. And yeah, thank you again for everyone who joined. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you everybody who was here. Thanks, Nikki. And just a reminder to everyone, the slide deck has a, a number of links and resources. So please uh, take a look at those. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.